We are going to always support our food banks. We're always going to support our pantries. But listen, this is how we can support more people. And this is sustainable. People need sustainable solutions. So I always consider that I am the voice of people that are experiencing hunger. And that's who I want to enter the room with me anytime I'm talking to someone about doing business with Gooder, because ultimately, in some way or some form, we're going to be feeding people. And I want people to know what it's like on the other side. Hi, folks. I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where we're talking to the innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are committed to building successful businesses that also help us build a better world. Anyone that knows me and anyone that's been listening to the pod for a while knows that one of my biggest passions is food. I've said it before, but when it comes to real consensus, the things that bring us together, build bonds, and create lasting memories, there's hardly anything more powerful and easier to agree on than a really great meal. We've had a lot of awesome food-related conversations on the show, from those who cook and serve it, like Eric Olberholzer of Cohere and Tender Greens, to those who grow it, like Jamila Norman of Patchwork City Farms, to those who are innovating in agricultural science and technology to support those growers, like Nico Pinkowski of Nutricity and Ron Hovsepian of Indigo. Those were all fantastic conversations that I had a blast recording and sharing with you, so go check them out next if you haven't already. When it comes to food, though, Some of the most meaningful conversations that we've had have been with folks who are fighting food waste and hunger. We're going to get into the actual numbers in today's episode, so I won't hit you with the stats up front. But among the many challenges we face in America, I'm not sure there's anything that makes me personally feel crazier than the fact that we have such a food waste problem on such a massive scale that it's measurably contributing to climate change, while simultaneously tens of millions of our fellow citizens struggle with food insecurity and hunger. And as much as it's a moral issue that people shouldn't go hungry, which is still the absolute number one thing, of course, it's also just frustratingly bad business. It's a gigantic market inefficiency. So much of that waste of food is a product that could still have value. It's like watching businesses literally throw money into the garbage, which is why the folks who have come up with innovative solutions to fighting back against this problem are some of my biggest business heroes. So food waste and food insecurity is a space that's important to me. And naturally, any kind of content in that space will grab my attention. So I remember a while ago when I came across a TED Talk with the title, Hunger is Not a Question of Scarcity. I had to give it a watch, and I was absolutely blown away. Let me give you a little quote from it that stuck with me ever since. From the palm of our hands, we can watch our favorite TV shows, listen to music, get a ride, order groceries. Surely if we can use technology to meet our future husband or wife, we could use it to fight hunger. We could use it to help get excess food from businesses directly to families in need. I was like, yes, this is exactly it. I knew I had to learn more about the speaker and her work. And the more I learned about her tech-forward solution to hunger and food waste, the more I knew we had to get her on the podcast. Well, now the stars have finally aligned for that to happen. So it's my absolute pleasure and privilege this week to welcome to Consensus and Conversation Jasmine Crow Houston, founder and CEO of Gooder, a startup leveraging data, technology, and cutting-edge logistics to help businesses waste less food, feed more people, and improve their bottom line. Jasmine is such a source of inspiration. She's an award-winning business leader who's been named by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential female founders. She's an incredible advocate and communicator for the issue of food security as a TED speaker and children's author. And she's just the kind of compassionate and motivated person who sees a problem happening in her community and decides to make it her mission to solve it. It was so exciting getting her on the show. And so without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. Hey, Jasmine, how's it going today? It's going great. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thanks again for joining us. I want to start just like way back in the beginning with a little bit about you and where you're from and what your life was like growing up. You know, I am a military kid, so I've lived a little bit of everywhere, honestly. But I, I would say mostly I'm from the Southwest. I was born in Texas. I lived in New Mexico, Arizona. My dad got out of the military when I was in the eighth grade and we moved to North Carolina. So a lot of times I tell people I'm from North Carolina because that is where I went to high school and college. It really was the state I lived in the longest until I moved to Atlanta in 2013. And I've been here now for 11 years. 
Amazing. And you studied mass communication in school, right? I feel like that's foreshadowing this really important side of your career where you're just this incredible public speaker and incredible communicator on really important topics, including that of hunger. So I'm curious, like, as you think about studying from an academic perspective communications, now that you're a, a multi-time founder, what kind of communications advice would you have for impact entrepreneurs about telling their story, shaping their message for audiences? How would you coach other budding impact entrepreneurs to be better storytellers? Yeah, I think storytelling is so imperative. And, and one thing that's so funny, a lot of people don't know this, I was never really a public speaker, if you will. Um, I was really shy of my voice and, and just kind of really teased about it as a kid. But I, I went into communications with the goal of possibly doing radio or maybe broadcast journalism. I love sports, so I always wanted to be like a sports broadcaster. But 100% telling the story of why you want to make an impact and also why you're the person to solve this problem is so critical because people need to not buy into your story, but they need to believe that you could do it. And you need to believe that you can do it. And you have to have a why. And, and again, this is in my opinion, there's a why you want to solve hunger or you want to make sure that our water quality is better, or you want to make sure that, you know, we have a beautiful earth to live in a hundred years from now. There's a why, and people need to know that why, specifically if you want them to join you on the mission. Yeah. I mean, jumping ahead a little bit, we, we've got to talk about your incredible TED Talks, because I think it's so inspiring. So I'm curious, I guess, let's just start from like, what was it like to be asked to give a TED Talk? How did that process unfold? Well, you know, it was crazy. You get the email and you're kind of like, wow, are they are they really asking me to give a TED Talk at TED Women? And they did. And I had an amazing experience is for sure. Uh, that and giving a commencement speech at my college go down as my top two talks ever. But it was a lot of practice and a lot of work. I think what people don't know is that you really have to remember that talk. There is no teleprompter. You do not have notes. You have to submit your talk in written form so that it can be translated in hundreds of languages and in captions when it's broadcast. So it's a lot of work. It was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. I mean, it, it took me months to prepare for 12 minutes. I mean, we're going to link to it because it's a really, like I guess, an inspirational talk. I'm, I'm curious, like as you began the writing process, where did you find your inspiration? How did you craft the story? You know, it was just real. I mean, I started feeding people living on the streets back in 2013. So literally when I first moved to Atlanta and I saw hunger at a lens that so many people will never see it, you know, and I experienced it. I had friends and family members that were going hungry. I was feeding people that were hungry and this story needed to be told of what it's like for people on the other side, because I think that was what was missing. A lot of people give and they tithe and they give to charity. They support the food bank. They give donations and they're doing the right thing. But what people don't often see is what it's like on the other side of that line. And so if you're someone who has to receive food, what kind of food are you receiving? What does that look like for you? What kind of cycle does that put you through in the midst of your trouble? And so knowing that story intimately was really just like, let me tell you about a time that I was giving food to people and this is what it was. And this is why I decided I needed to change how we solve hunger and, and food waste in this country. Before we dig too much into Gooder, I also want to just touch on, you know, you're a multi-time founder and I, I want to hear a little bit about kind of your career getting to Gooder and, and I definitely want to hear about BlackCelebrityGiving.com, which was, you know, I think a really interesting venture. So first question on that front is just, when did you realize you wanted to create something and be a founder? Like when did that founder energy, you know, you first become aware of it? You know, I feel like I've been kind of an entrepreneur since I was 13. I worked for this company. I don't even know if they're still around now, but it was like a franchise called Tumble Tots. And I taught gymnastics and daycares. And so it was the cutest little, um, it was just amazing. The parents would pay $5 a class. And I would come there and I would get, I think, $3 a student. And the franchisee was a, a young lady. I think she did gymnastics. You know, she might have been in her 20s, early 30s. And so we had like a split right away. And that was like what I, I first did. So I think, you know, a lot of people were doing babysitting. Here I am teaching a class. And my grandmother, who once lived in a very small town called Tularosa, New Mexico, and me and all my cousins went there one summer. 
And she said by the end of the week, I had basically a whole summer camp with activities lined up for all the kids. She always tells me that story that she just knew then that I was going to be doing something to like corral the people and help the people. So I always think that is such a funny story. I think it started young. I know for a fact the desire to help people started at about eight or nine when I took a trip to Washington, D.C. with my dad, who was in the Air Force at the time. And I remember seeing people experiencing homelessness and and wondering why that was and asking my dad so many questions. So it it started young. It really did. So where did the idea for Black Liberty Giving come from? Like, how, how did you come up with that first concept? Well, that came from, it was just a real interesting realm. I was working for the Phoenix Suns. uh, So I was moved to Phoenix, Arizona after college. I was working in sales. So like selling suites and season tickets. And I started to really love the community relations aspect of it. So working with different players, like at the time, this is like Boris Diaw, Amari Sotomayor, the Super Bowl came to Phoenix in 2008. And I got a chance to work on a camp with like Ray Lewis. And I started helping football players. So mostly NFL athletes, rookies, uh, they come out of the draft. And one of the first things they often do is start a nonprofit, like and their parents start to run it and they're doing good work in the community. And so that was my job really for a long time. I would manage their football camp, their programming, get all of their sponsors, work with the NBA players that are trying to do good in the communities. I mean, why it was unique in Phoenix, Arizona at the time, and even now, the city as a whole is about 4%, 4 to 5% Black, African-American, so a small percentage. And so I was helping these celebrities that were also Black do good in their communities and really use their star power for good. And what I realized is that those stories were not often being told. Like, you know, you would see kind of all the glittery stuff, like they flew to this country and they did this and they have this necklace, but the things that they were doing in the community, you know, it would be hard to get the media to come out for it. And I decided to start, you know, telling these stories and and they were so good. I mean, one of the stories, it was a blog post I did on Whitney Houston's giving right around the time that she passed away. That was one of the biggest stories, you know, that our blog ever saw with millions of impressions, thousands every single day. Because people just didn't know, and I wanted to talk about the good. Yeah. I mean, it's so perfectly aligned with consensus, right? Like, what what I am passionate about is telling the uplifting stories. There's so many people, you know, covering all the negativity and all the hate and all the the downside and all this, like, we need more positivity, I think. And so I I love the concept. I'm curious, as you kind of, what you think you learned most from that experience that you kind of carried with you as an entrepreneur? The one thing I learned through building BCG was that I didn't want to be a solo entrepreneur, meaning I didn't want to be my only employee because I did everything. I wrote all the blogs. I attended all the events. I hosted all the activations. I created all the programming. I was the face of the company, just everything. And so, you know, I learned it was really hard. It definitely was hard. I think it's important to know that for Really, the entire time I had Black Celebrity Giving, I was still working. I did it full time for a year from 2012 to 2013. But even then, I was still bartending. Like I had like a lot of side hustles, if you will. I wasn't making a lot of money. I was doing a lot of good, but it was so hard to do everything by myself. So that's the one thing that I learned is, you know, what I had the power to do a lot of good. And I did a lot of good with BCG as well. I think about, you know, the trips I took. I took people to Haiti and to... South Africa and Panama. I mean, I've done so much all around the world, so I I will carry that with me forever. But it was always just me. And it's, you know, you take 60 people uh, to South Africa and you plan everything and you're the the person that everybody communicates with. It was a lot. So uh, one big thing I learned was that I needed a team. You know, they say the most recent research data on what keeps people at jobs the longest is not fulfillment, it's not money, it's friends. And like, if you don't have that communion with other people in your work, it, that can be really hard. I think that's yeah. really underestimated. Um, the other thing I want to just touch on, especially given how closely aligned you were with the sports community, you know, we had a great conversation early on in, in the podcast with Roger McClendon, who's the CEO of the Green Sports Alliance. And he spoke so eloquently about the power of sports as a a way to overcome big challenges that we face in the world. And as someone who is in the impact entrepreneur space now overcoming big challenges, I'm curious, like if you look back at your time in sports from an advocacy and philanthropic perspective and see how that industry and those 
people can be, you know, are such great um, catalysts for positive change. I think sports is a huge driver for social change, and Gooder is a testament to that. We've had the opportunity to work with several of the leagues. We did food recovery for the Super Bowl when it was in Atlanta in 2019. We still today work with several players and their families to feed their communities. I mean, so people love sports. I'm, I am one of those people. And I just have a hundred stories I could tell you about some athlete, Jalen Brown, you know, just won the NBA finals. And I remember during the pandemic, he's from Atlanta, sent us money to feed people here. Never met us, but just heard about the good that we do and wanted to support. So there are so many stories like that that um, I just love. Yeah, I want to dig into this a ton. So now, perfect, perfect segue to get into gutter. So it's 2013 and you moved to Atlanta. How did you actually kind of get involved with fighting food insecurity to start with? Give us like the story that got you on this path to what eventually becomes starting Gooder. Yeah, so it's a it's an interesting story. I was, as you know, working with celebrities, helping them with their nonprofits on the side. And I was working with a client who shall remain nameless because still a really good friend. But I said to them, you know, here we are in November. It's a very busy time in celebrity philanthropy, just in philanthropy, period. Everybody wants to give back around uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and back to school. And so I said to them, the people that are standing in line for a turkey, people are also hungry in June. You know, this is not just once a year, people need a turkey. We should be doing something year round. And what I realized in that moment is that they are entertainers. They're athletes. You know, their focus is on playing on the field or being on stage performing. And so they were probably never going to have like a year round food program, but it was important to me. And so I drove through downtown, started feeding people on the street, doing it for almost four years, hosting pop up restaurants. I would rent tables, chairs, linens, flowers, all the works and make people feel like they were at a restaurant actually being treated with dignity. And a video of my work went viral on Facebook. And I woke up one morning to just millions of views, friend requests, comments. And one of the reoccurring things people kept asking me was who donated the food? And the truth was nobody. I was couponing, I'm price matching, I'm cooking all this food myself. And I think I should get this food donated. And so I go to Google and I really truly believe that I felt like I was going to get a list of like, here are all the restaurants that give food donations to organizations that are feeding people. And it was going to just be buttoned up and I would go to them and continue to feed people. And I fell into food waste really just a deep rabbit hole and just couldn't believe just how much perfectly good food was going to waste while so many people were going hungry. Yeah. I, I mean, that blew me away. And that was kind of the beginning of Gooder. So what's so unique, and we, we talked about this previously, is what, what so many people, I think, see as an obvious philanthropic effort, you saw as a business venture. I think that's so cool. And it takes such a special perspective to look at things differently through a different lens. So can you, you know, give us a sense of how you then began to believe this was not just an opportunity for philanthropy, but an opportunity for business. Where did that come from? Well, something happened. It was it was really unique. So the video went viral. I started learning about food waste. Someone started a GoFundMe. He says in his GoFundMe, I saw this organization feeding people on the streets and I want to do the same thing here in Philadelphia. You know, I've done the math. I'm going to give everybody a coat and I'm going to give everybody a meal and it's going to cost me $150 per person. And he raised like $40,000 to do my idea that I have been doing for four years and had never raised probably more than $1,000 in donations. So I thought, wow, like, you know, my goodness is already being kind of taken and someone else is making money from my genius, you know, that I created. You, no one else was doing these kind of restaurants to treat people and feed people things that you and I would go to a restaurant and eat. And so what made me think about the nonprofit space is I, I realized right then I would always be fo focusing and fighting for donations to do something that was good when businesses were paying to throw the food away. They were already paying. So this was not a, hey, you donate your food already and you're doing the right thing. So I'm going to come in and now charge you for it. It was very much like you're paying to throw this food away. And thousands of people within a mile of here don't know where their next meal is coming from tonight. And also, I learned that they were throwing away money. They didn't have any kind of measurement of what's going in the trash can. They're paying often for pickups they don't even need. There's no tax expense that they can write off for doing good. 
and that it was really bad for the environment and they didn't know about it. So I, I saw that there was a business opportunity and that GoFundMe that that guy created made me know that if I built it as a nonprofit, I would always just be fighting for donations and be fighting through others too, which you still kind of do as a business, but it was, it was a different lens that I think I'm really grateful that happened. Yeah. And I mean, so if, if you were to kind of give the elevator pitch today, how do you explain you know, what Gooder is to someone who's never heard of it before? Yeah. And it certainly evolved since I started it. But today I say that Gooder is a sustainable waste management and hunger solutions company. We leverage technology and logistics to feed more people and waste less food. Now, you, I know you've, you're in the, your original TED Talk and in the company, I think, description, you've got this great quote, hunger isn't a scarcity issue, it's a matter of logistics. And I, I hear you say logistics in, in how you just described it. So walk us through like where this breakdown is actually happening and kind of in the process in the American kind of food system. Well, there's a, it's a lot. So if you think about it, we spend $218 billion a year on food that we never eat. And so this is from farm to fork to waste bin. It goes into the transportation of the food, the packaging of the food, the production of the food, the cooking of the food, the disposing of the food across that whole lens. $218 billion, 2% of U.S. GDP. So if you think of everything that we spend money on in this country, 2% goes to food that we never eat. So 2%, let's just say, goes 100% to waste, which is a crazy thing to think about when you consider the fact that so many people go hungry in this country. It just didn't make sense. So there's more than enough food, right? Food exists. It's not that we don't have enough food. It's that we are distributing it or using our logistics around to take it from your business to the waste bin instead of seeing, hey, what if this food is good? So obviously you guys come up with a solution. Walk us through what the solution looks like. So what we built now, what our first kind of version was, is that we inventoried everything it is that a business sells. We made it really simple for the business to click on the item, tell us how many requests to pick up. We get those items picked up while inventoried and delivered to a nonprofit. And then we give the business back all the data around who they served, how much food they kept out of landfill. We weigh it. We convert that weight into CO2 emissions that they've helped to offset instead of going into landfill. We also tell them the value of the food that they donated, provide them a donation record, and then really kind of a overall look at what they're wasting on a consistent basis and predictive analytics and post analytics on things that they could do better, ways that they could drive their waste down. Uh, so that is essentially good or in a nutshell as it relates to food waste. We also handle all non-edible food. And I think that's one of the big things that makes us different is we are, we like to say we're food's best friend. We want to make sure that the food ends up in its best place possible, right? So we don't want it to end up in landfill. Someone worked hard, they farmed it, they cooked it. So we want it to either go to compost, we want to either feed it to animals, turn it into another byproduct. And if it's good, we want it to go to people. So end to end, tracking everything, looking at all the data, helping our customers drive down food waste, and also helping us all breathe in better air and, and make sure our neighbors, you know, don't go hungry. So that's what it is. One of the things I love about Gooder and what you've built is that it, is, it epitomizes kind of finding those win-win-win solutions where, you know, companies are winning, society's winning, people are winning, by solving a real problem. It's so powerful as a story. So how, how important was that to you in, in the building of the business process? Like, how did you kind of create the solution where everyone walked away as a winner? Well, you know, I think for me, it was built into who I am. You know, I was already doing good work. So I think if I had been like an investment banker, I would have came in and just cared about like, how do I make money? And that's it. But I was feeding people prior to starting this company. And I realized that a lot of people were still going hungry. So I knew that that needed to exist. I knew that the business needed to buy into the service so that there had to be a business win for them. There's, you know, the whiff on what's in it for this business to do business with Gooder. And then by natural benefit, society was going to get better. I mean, now I think we're on our way to 40 million meals, 20 something million pounds that we've kept out of landfill. It's, it's crazy to think about the impact that we've had really in six years. Because while on paper, I started this company in 2017, I had no technology, no customers, no team members, nothing until 2018. And, and quite frankly, September, October of 2018 is when I really started. So it's been a lot of good in not a lot of years. Yeah. I'm curious, I mean, what was that first 
pitch like, or not the first pitch, but the first yes that you had from a business that said, yeah, we want in on this. Like, do you remember who that business was and how the pitch went? And like, everyone remembers their first sale, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my first, I wouldn't call it a sale at first because there was really no money exchanged in the beginning, but it was kind of a use case. And so I remember a executive assistant secretary reached out to me on Instagram and said, hey, I'm over here at Turner Broadcasting Systems, you know, Cartoon Network, TBS, TNT. We have a lot of food here. And I want to present you in front of all of the other executive assistants who always order all this food that goes to waste and the executive chef. And so I got an opportunity to meet with Chef Ryan, who's still a great, great friend till this day. And what he did for me is allow me to test my theory that he could reach out to me when they had excess food. I could give them the packaging materials and the labels for that food. I could get it picked up. I would deliver it to the nonprofits. I would send him back the picture, get him a donation receipt. And so that was a huge win for me because it really was the fabric of what I was building. It was the opportunity to prove it out. And it helped me learn a lot more. So it was through that process that I realized, hey, I'm getting a list of everything it is that he's donating every single week. I should be also telling him what he's wasting the most. I should show him that, you know, pork is the number one thing that he donates every two or three days without fail. He would text me and say, hey, Jasmine, I'm going to need more packaging materials. So when I would pick up food, I would leave more materials. I just learned the entire process. So that was the kind of first yes. And then I think from there, the biggest customer that I won, which everyone always can never believe this, is my first customer happened to be the Atlanta airport. And that came through a pitch competition. They were looking for startups, innovative ideas and solutions to make the airport be more efficient. And I thought, well, my God, there is nobody that is a bigger carbon emitter in the airport. And yeah, they're flying all these planes like this is where all the carbon is coming from. I really got to get in there and tell them about the food waste and let's get this food to people and the airport in Atlanta sits in a food desert where about 60% of the children live in poverty. And so there was a real opportunity for that airport to get all those extra meals, the sandwiches, the fruit cups, the salads, all of that stuff, donate it. And that was the first customer. And that was a six-figure customer. So it was a, a real blessing to get in with them. That is really amazing. And do you think that the executives for them, it is a human connection. Like they understand where this food's going now. Like they're actually helping to feed a family, feed a child, service a food desert, or, you know, how much of it is the human versus they're doing actually great things for their ESG score and their impact credentials. And so it's a, it's a metric basis. So like, how do you see the customers on the corporate side understanding kind of the impact they're having? Is it on paper or is it with humanity? Well, it depends. Everyone is different. Some people are very much like, hey, I'm in it for the tax savings. I need to show the financial win here. Some people are like, hey, I definitely want to feed people, but I also need to show it. And then other people, it's like, hey, we put on our website, we're cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2025, and we've got six months to do it and we haven't started. Um, and so for some, it's really about the sustainability. Some, it's really the financial incentive and others. It's the, hey, I want to do good. And for some, it's all of the above. But everybody I've learned over the years has a different reason why this is something that they want to do. As you kind of now have built a scaled business, right? You kind of built teams and built two different, not divisions, I don't know if you call them divisions, but you've got your food waste solutions and your hunger relief solutions. Like, what's the process of, of growth and scaling been like? How have you been able to take on more and build bigger, more complex solutions? I think you learn from your customers. You have to learn from your team members and they hear, you know, they hear the feedback of like, these are the things that we need. And, you know, you go back to that product team and the, I mean, those roadmap sessions for us when we're building, what are we going to build? Every team wants something different. I think the biggest one we always have to ask ourselves is, are we still aligned with our core values? Are we still going to serve the mission of feeding more people and wasting less food? And is this going to help us do it faster? And what's the business case on everything that we do? I think the hunger side of our business, which kind of blossomed really as a relation to the pandemic, really was another opportunity to grow a business set and do really well at it. And I think being really good at what we do has to be the priority. And I think that's what I've always focused on is not so much, do I make the most money? Do I have the biggest name? 
but are we the best? And if I can say that to any customer that I talk to, especially, you know, a lot of people are like, well, who do you go up against the most? And a lot of times it's waste companies. I mean, what's happening to this food currently is it's going in the trash can and it's been going in the trash can for, you know, 50 years before I got here. It's handled. I don't really want to deviate from it. We have to go up against that and say, like, listen, this is not the right thing to do. And it's the same thing when we go to cities and we talk about our hunger solutions. It's like, listen, we are going to always support our food banks. We're always going to support our pantries. But listen, this is how we can support more people. And this is sustainable. People need sustainable solutions. So I always consider that I am the voice of people that are experiencing hunger. And that's who I want to enter the room with me anytime I'm talking to someone about doing business with Gooder, because ultimately, in some way or some form, we're going to be feeding people. And I want people to know what it's like on the other side. You, you kind of just mentioned it, and I feel like it's worth really digging into, but what did COVID do for you, for your business, slash how did COVID change or maybe shine a light on you know some of the, the complexity or the scale of the, the food insecurity situation in America? Because I feel like you kind of had this thing going and then COVID hits and like... And it all goes away, yeah. Yeah, what, what was oh. that like? Tell us about that. It was really scary, you know, because we were, at the time COVID hit, almost two years old, just kind of really getting some steam. We had raised a little bit of money. And I mean, even still today, Gooders raised a little bit of money, but we raised at that time a million dollars two years in. And we're thinking we were going to need to raise more money to like scale the solution. And then all the customers that we had were like, hey, you know, our cafeterias are closed. We're, we'll put it, stop working. Maybe we'll be back in two weeks. Maybe we won't. Or they were very much like, hey, we don't want to donate any food because we don't know what's happening with the COVID. And, you know, it was just a lot that was happening. So I remember the day, I'll never forget, March 8th is the day that Georgia, where I was living at the time, went into quarantine. And I'm thinking like, wow, what are we going to do? But we got a lot of calls. I mean, within those first few weeks, we must have moved hundreds and thousands of pounds. So everybody from NASCAR, the final four was going to be in Georgia like seven days later. So we had thousands of chicken wings and all the, anything you could think of was in the city and the whole state shut down. So we moved a lot of food within the first two weeks. Lots of news stories were done about how much food we were getting to Atlanta nonprofits that were in turn going to get this food out to people. And I got a call from the superintendent of Atlanta Public Schools. And she said, hey, we've got all these students that are learning virtually and they get free breakfast and lunch, and we need to get food delivered to them. And we thought, listen, let's reverse engineer the technology. And instead of picking up excess food, let's pick up prepared foods and still deliver it to people in need. And so we worked with APS to pick up from several different sites to deliver along bus routes into community centers, and then also taking anything that was extra, right? If some students didn't show, we learned really soon that once school was kind of out, kids were not waking up like on the bus route time. So we kind of changed our timing, but we got anything extra to senior homes and we started feeding people. And then we got calls that were like, hey, the moms and dads at the house, they don't have food. Is there anything you can do? And I really just went to Twitter at the time, X now, and said, hey, I will feed people. If you guys will send us money, I will deliver groceries. We will get food to families. And started literally a whole hunger solutions campaign to deliver food, again, using logistics to get food to people. I must have hired, you know, 50 or 60 drivers in a matter of hours who signed on with me and were on the road delivering boxes of food or bags of meals for the whole week to students and hunger solutions was birthed. So it really was, again, about knowing hunger, right? And if, if hunger is bad, on right. a day when there is no pandemic, you have to believe that on a day when there's a pandemic and people aren't working and kids are out of school, everything exasperates and it gets a lot worse. So it was about knowing. And from that, just got tons of opportunities to work with cities and counties and, you know, the NBA and the Atlanta Hawks and several players because we were really still good at what we did. And it was all about dignity and treating people you know, how we would want to be treated if we were ever hungry. That's that's the idea. Give us a sense of how of the scale of Gooder today. Like how big, you know, wh where all are you guys operating and how big of a solution have you guys built? I mean, I feel like we've built a really good solution. I was just looking at our most recent impact report from 2023 and I was like, wow, like it includes a heat map 
of everywhere that Gooder has been. And it it blew my mind to look at this map and think like, I was hoping to do this maybe throughout the Southeast at one point. When I first started Gooder, I was thinking, my God, if I could start this in Atlanta and solve hunger in Atlanta. Right. Um, but just last month, we had 13 states we were activating in. Within those states, lots of cities where we have clients and, you know, everyone from, we have customers in Oregon to customers in Florida and crisscross in between. So across the U.S., we, we've really been there. And it's, you know, I think a testament that it is scaled uh, nationally, that you've had real investors come your way and, and want to be a part of this company. What was the process like of engaging with, you know, venture capitalists, investors? Like, how did they receive this pitch? And, you know, this comes from, I spent a decade as a banker, so I know yeah. this world intimately. Uh, but what, what was that like? Because a very different stakeholder yeah. group to begin working with. <laughs> oh, it was, a, it was and is still to this day the hardest thing ever. Like I always tell people that are like, hey, I want to raise venture capital. I'm like, find a different way first. This is not an easy thing to do. It was yeah. 200 plus meetings to start with before yeah. I ever got the very first yes. And it was a realization that I needed to change my pitch. I needed to talk less about you know, the bright side of people eating and the world being better and, you know, the environment and really talk numbers. This is how I'm going to make money. This is my business model. These are the customers I'm going to sell to. This is, you know, my business plan. I feel like I over planned and over pitched. I mean, I had more than anybody else. I remember an investor looked at my data room and said, this is the best data room I've ever seen. Like this is by far. And it was just, again, like me putting everything in in there to try and get a yes out. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, I think people assume that for some, this is an easy process and it's just never, you know, this is the investor process is grueling. And for many, I know it's spirit breaking. And so I think it's one of the kind of the things we're less honest about as entrepreneurs is how hard that process can be for, for companies. You know, 200 meetings is brutal. Like how do you, how does anyone... Yeah continue their job of running the company while doing 200 meetings, you know, try, it, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, it was, it was really hard. I always would say things like, okay, I'm going to take 50 meetings. If no one says yes, I'll quit. I always laughed at my dad during the fundraising process, which, you know, for me took almost two years. Let's say I started good in, in January of 2017. I raised capital at October of 2018. So a very long time yeah. to get there. My dad sent me more jobs during those years than anything else because it was kind of like, hey, this may not happen. You know, what? Are, how are you going to feed yourself? How are you going to keep your lights on? So it was it was a lot. It was a grueling process. But I was entering pitch competitions in the time that I was fundraising. And so I would use the prize money to kind of keep the business going, whether that was yeah. I win $5,000 and I'd make sure that we had a website or that we had business cards that I could go to this conference and talk to people. So I, I really was trying to sparingly bootstrap with what I had. But once the first investor said yes, you know, everybody else came on. And so it was a it was a really good thing. Yeah. I, I don't want to lose track of, of the actual impact. I think one of the things that makes the story so powerful is that it, it's so real for so many you know, thousands of families and people every day and, you know, so good on the environment and helps companies. But I'm curious, like, as you guys kind of think about your impact report from the most recent impact report, for example, give folks again a sense of the overall impact as you look at it. So what are kind of the metrics that when you think back at this point, you're so proud of and you want to make sure, you know, are highlights that everyone recognizes how, how just the incredible work that you've done? Oh, there's so many. I think, what could I say? I think it still comes down to the number of people that we fed. I think there's nothing bigger yeah. than that. We were looking at our impact report and the number of families that we touched just one time was 50,000. Just like this family, we touched them one time last year, they received food from us. This doesn't include our nonprofits that are receiving food from our food right. donations. These are actual physical families that we touched at least once when the reality is multiple of those families received meals from us on a multitude of times, so more than one time. I mean, that's incredible to think about yeah. the number of households that, you know, we can make a difference in their lives. So I still am really proud of that. And, you know, I think if you ever look at our impact report, my team did a great job of breaking down what these numbers mean. So how many gallons of water? And it was like 748 million gallons of water that we saved. I mean, it was it was mind-blowing because like, what? Like, like, who knew we've done that much 
it was really, there's so many yeah. things that I could think of, but we've done a lot. Well, I want to make sure we put the most recent impact report into the show notes for folks too. I think that it's one of the things that we were just in awe of when we were researching. You hinted at this for a second, but you also do have the Gooder Foundation as a nonprofit component of your work. What is that for folks who aren't familiar? Yeah, we started the foundation right around the same time as the pandemic. And so it was like, hey, we wanted to create a program where we were feeding kids on the weekends. As we started to deliver meals into these communities, we started to see childhood hunger, I think more intimately, and particularly in some neighborhoods where it was really dire. Uh, so we started this foundation to start a program called Neighborhood Eat, which would provide kids with a hot meal on site, a hot meal to go, and then a snack pack with meals for Sunday. So really to feed them on the weekend. We provided the food to not only the children, but also anyone in the community. So we started to see a lot of parents um, we were doing things like etiquette classes for the kids, zoo field trips. We brought out a tutor every weekend. And so we still do that. And, and that's really where the foundation kind of launched. But it's it's designed to figure out more ways to do more to make sure that kids and, and seniors have access to food on a consistent basis. And that's awesome. The other kind of question I just had on the initiative front, you guys have the, the Gooder Grocery Store Program, which is such a cool concept. Yeah, um, thank you. And I was curious if you could tell us a bit about that story. Yeah, I think, you know, a celebrity client reached out to me in 2021 wanting to do something for back to school. And I said, sure, you know, but let's not do another backpack drive. Let, let's, you know, do something different. And I said, I had this idea to put a grocery store in a school. And the reason why is I realized, again, the logistics issue. A lot of these kids are living in food deserts, but the one ride they have on a day to day basis is to and from school on the bus. And so that if we could put food for these kids to take home to their families in a school and make it to where everybody got the bag so there wasn't a shame thing to it, it was open before and after school hours so parents could come, we would really help solve hunger. And so we found a school, actually the school that they went to in middle school, just getting back to school after the pandemic. So if you think about it, September 2021, would have been the first probably month or so those kids were back in the classroom. I don't think they went yeah, back. Yeah, first until, back to school. Yeah, I don't think they went back until August of that year. Yeah. So it worked and it was amazing. Still standing today, you know, uh, three years later, that store is still there. So this goes its fourth school year. And now we have, you know, 25 or so across the country doing the same thing. So it, it really is a concept it really is a play back on when I was feeding people on the streets. It really is like we can create a sustainable model that provides people with a place to go anytime they need food and get good food. And we want every time someone interacts with Gooder that they leave with seven to 10 days worth of food that they choose. Because as I said, a lot of people don't know what it's like on the other side. And, and I pray that for most people, you never do, right? You don't want to know what it's like to be hungry and be given a box of food with 30 things in it you've never seen, you've never cooked, or that you're allergic to. So it's really important to create these stores that you walk in and you say, hey, I'm going to make my kids chicken Alfredo tonight. I need broccoli, chicken, Alfredo sauce, pasta, bread. I also need some cereal. They need whatever else is in the household. And you take that home. Now you know and Twitter knows this food doesn't go to waste, that these families are picking out the things that they need and it's going to get them through. I love it. So, I mean, I get to have conversations like this every week with founders like you who are, are building such inspiring companies and making such a, a positive impact on the world. And it just continues to fuel my own optimism that the world's going to be okay, that people, passionate, energetic, smart, hardworking people are, are doing such good things. I'm curious what inspires you and gives you hope day to day to keep you on this path. I think what inspires me is to see the change that we've made and to know that there's still so much more that needs to happen. I think I really do believe, and I, again, I use the sports analogy of like, you can never shoot a perfect shot and stay there too long. You've got to get down on the other side of the court because the team is scoring, you know? And I think about that is, as much as we've done, as proud as I, I am of, of the things that we've achieved, the reality is so many people are still going hungry and that I've got to do more to, to make sure that this is solved. 
first in this country, and then I want to do it across the world. So I think I'm inspired by what we've been able to do with just a little. We've been able to do a lot. And so I know if I keep on going and we get more opportunities, I want to work with every city. I want to work with every state, every company. Like if I could work with everybody to do a little bit of gooder, the world will be a much better place. And, and I believe that will happen. Huge thanks to Jasmine and Crow Houston for joining us on Consensus in Conversation this week. To find out more about Gooder, visit their website at gooder.co. That's G-O-O-D-R dot C-O. We'll have a link and all the socials in the show notes so you can go directly connect with Gooder and Jasmine further. And also make sure to check out those show notes on Spotify for this week's Q&A. As always, you can email us at CIC at consensus-digital.com. That's CIC at consensus-digital.com. You can also message me directly on LinkedIn and threads at CKGON. That's at C-K-G-O-N-E. Send us your questions, comments, or ideas for future guests. We love getting your feedback. If you've enjoyed this episode, please take a second to leave us a rating and review us on Apple Podcasts. It's so helpful with growing our reach and adding new people to the conversation. And it helps us continue bringing you more awesome talks with the business leaders you want to hear from. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back next week with a brand new conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted and executive produced by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode was produced by Will Gatchell and Jeff Rock with editing from the good folks at Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to the Consensus team, including creative director Kate Tucker, Greg Hergel on research, and Patrick Gallagher on strategy. Consensus in Conversation can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Consensus in Conversation is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume.